The Olden World, written by Tsar Yoshi. Chapter 911 Curiosity Killed the Scientist. Is that Moonglass? Willie pointed a shocked hoof at the damaged tank, black crystal spokes poking out from the surface and through cracks in the sides. That's your name for it? Anemone had a mob diligently cleaning spilt liquid from the cracked tank. Anyway, funny seeing you here. What did you do? Shrinkback asked, staring at the damage. Professor Seastar shrugged, stepping back towards the exit. That's your problem to explain. I'll be seeing if our readings have miraculously changed over the weekend. And Emily slumped, taking a lab stool next to an intact tank and seating herself. Friends, I'm guessing? She glanced between Shinespark, Starlight, and Yala. Willie frowned. Came to see if you wanted to hang out. I guess these things are trouble no matter which side of the mountains we're on, though. What did you do? Tried submerging it in an ether bath, Anemone replied. We pipe it up from down below so we can experiment with it. Ether is intensely harmonic, so I thought it might counteract and neutralize the heart's passive effect. Valet raised an eyebrow. And you didn't think to just drip a little on first to see if it would go bad instead of tossing in the whole thing? Anemone shook her head. We have splash protocol. First, we put it in a tank of running water, then switch the water feed over to ether to flush the tank and refill it. Look, before we point hooves, have you seen this before and do you know how to clean it up? I've tried a crowbar and these crystals are unbreakable. Ah, well, I glanced at Nyala. The only thing I've ever seen like it is that there are ways to liquefy the stuff and inject it into the hearts and that causes them to explode with magical eyes. Uh, she frowned, stepped closer, sniffed it, and raised a huff. Anemone looked at her skeptically. You're going for the touch test already? I've only handled it with gloves. Valet shrugged. I have a thing that gives me a good idea of whether touching something will kill me. Then she wound up and punched the black crystals as hard as she could. Ow, bananas! She jumped back, shaking her hoof and holding it, then glanced around at Starlight, Shinespark, and Yala. Ow! If that's freshly created, it's empty, Shinespark warned. Did you really just touch it because you felt like it? I knew it wasn't going to kill me, Valet repeated, nursing her hoof and tapping her cutie mark with her tail. Bananas, though. You were touching Moonglass is different for me now, or... She rubbed the hoof against her pendant. Or that stuff isn't actually Moonglass. Honestly felt more like the ice from the explosion only turned up to a million. Niala grimaced. Forgive me if I don't want to test it myself. Well, if you can touch it, uh, Shinespark reached out a hoof of her own, tapped it, and frowned. It's cold. Anemone watched them with stupefied fascination. If this is how you do science in the north, how are you not all dead? Valet's eyes shifted to Shinespark. Technically, she's the only one of us who hasn't been dead at some point or another, and that might even be a technicality depending on your beliefs about cutie marks. It happens. You just gotta know enough science and be friends with enough gods to come back. Anemone was still fascinated, but now equally disturbed. This thing feels... Valet held a hoof just a hair off the crystals again. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like if a rock hated you? This would be it. Starlight's ears twitched. No, that's not it, Valet grumbled, thinking. It's more like... Bleh, how do I put this into words? I just get this feeling. I'll touch it, Starlight volunteered. I don't think I can get glassed anymore. Uh, she glanced at her own cutie mark. Pull me off if something bad happens. Roger, Willie nodded. Tentatively, Starlight reached for it herself. She made contact, expecting the familiar grabbing sensation of loneliness given physical form, a rock that wanted to take her and keep her and never let her go. Instead, a cold apathy stung her hoof, like the substance was actively pushing her away. It wasn't grabbing, 
it was rejecting, and she imagined it might do it more violently if she attacked it like Valet. I don't think it's Moonglass, she agreed, pulling her hoof back as well. It looks the same, but it feels completely different. Anemone watched her with interest. So, you haven't seen this before, but you've seen enough that you have ideas? Valet slowly frowned. So, real quick, how much do you guys know about this stuff? She tapped a pendant on her chest. The professor recognized it on me, and I'm pretty sure she knew what it does to bats. But do you know how and why? The glass from the meteor, Anemone asked. Classified hazardous material. The only piece I'm aware of on the island is a chunk in Dr. Lostwell's collection. The archipelago is too small to have received any when it fell. Recently, though, there's been a debate about what to do with it now that we have the Ark Manta and can feasibly harvest the pieces that fell into the sea. It hasn't been extensively studied, as far as I know. Moonglass's loneliness in physical form started cut in, just like Ephra's hope in physical form. Maybe this new crystal is some other emotion. Anemone stared at her as if she had just invented the wheel. Really? That's what your Moonglass is? Starlight nodded. But that makes... Anemone's face twisted in thought. Hey! Starfish! She charged away, managing not to stumble despite the clunky safety suit that covered her body and legs. Valet and Starlight blinked at each other. I think you told them something they didn't know, Niala sighed. Is that bad? Valet raised an eyebrow. We do need them to lock these hearts up and disable them so they're not doing bad things to us and our friends, you know. I just... Niala swallowed. You heard what they said about what they were using either for, right? Rocket fuel? Valet slowly nodded. Yeah? If this is the bottom of the world, Niala said, then it's completely built on a sheet of ether, which makes it the world's foundation and sort of like the world's blood. They even said rock is a conductor, like how blood moves through our bodies. Do you really think that's something that should be experimented with? Shinespark blinked hard. Or placed on something to be fired into space. If any left the world, would it lose it for good? If this live stream stretches beneath the entire world, there's a lot of it, but once you find a way to extract and use it? I meant more on a spiritual level, Niala corrected. But that too. Valet's jaw sat slightly open. Okay, so scientists are messing with things that maybe should be left alone. Pessimistic solution? What else is new? Like, actually, seriously, what are we gonna do about it? Because these dudes are friendly and likely not evil, and I don't want to mess with that. There are places in Ice Reach I never showed you, Niala replied. Do you remember when I told you the story of the first casualty? The first bats to get glassed, back when they were using hearts to remove cutie marks 40 years ago, and the meteor hadn't even fallen yet? Valet raised an eyebrow. I'm pretty sure I do. I told it all to Amber, and in bits and pieces to everyone else. Niala nodded. After the research was decommissioned, I told you the scientists sealed the remaining Windigo hearts in a cave in the deepest part of the city. Remember? Valet blinked. The deepest? Wait, you mean this deep? I thought you just meant regular deep deep. Is that what you're getting at? Again, Niala nodded. Ice Reach has always been a cave complex. Many of the underground rooms we stayed in were originally caves that were sculpted into buildings, rather than digging whole rooms from scratch. She glanced at everyone, making sure they were following too. And there were a lot of unexplored areas, but if you went as far down as you could go, the caves were connected to the very bottom, and they left the hearts there and then blocked off the way down up near the top. Valet listened raptly. Where are you going with this? After Navarro and his team unsealed the caves and reclaimed the Windigo hearts, they didn't seal them again, Niala replied. You and I, the old you, went to explore them for fun. It had been thirty years, and everyone near the surface had either forgotten their significance, or had their memories tarnished by what had happened and what the caves were used to store. But we found guidelines and a trail to the bottom. Bonies used to go there a lot, it turns out. 
She smiled in remembrance, continuing. At the bottom, there was a holy place. We found carvings and writing, and learned how our people had been going there for thousands of years to pay their respects to the world we live in. You could feel it in the air that the Windigo hearts had been stored there, but had been consecrated by so many centuries of care that it would only be a matter of time until it was like the hearts were never there. I believe the reason the hearts were stored there wasn't to keep them far away from ponies, but because the ponies of Ice Reach were trying to counteract them too. Niala took her last breath before finishing. No one else really rediscovered that place. We kept it as our secret up until you, you know, but I can feel it in my hooves and wings how special it was. So now I have the chance to be this low again, but this is a place where ponies are trying to figure out how to use the world or making things like that. She pointed at the crystals. They're not here to thank or appreciate it. It has none of the feel of the cave and ice reach, and that's why I don't like it here. Bananas, Valet blinked. How come you never showed me this? That's a story for another time, Niala replied. It isn't important. What matters is that I don't like this, and maybe it's just me, but I still don't. Ah, Valet hunched her shoulders. Well, I'll grill them about it a bit for you. Now, where are those goons? Anemone and Professor Seastar turned out to already be on their way. What's this I'm hearing about loneliness given physical form, the professor demanded, an intense thirst for knowledge on her face. Hey, Doc. Took your time, Valley greeted. That's Moonglass. You know, looks sort of like this, except it fell from the sky. She pointed at the cruelly spiked explosion of crystal growth. What's it to you? Fascinating. Seastar stared at her for a moment. And this is the same van? She pointed at the crystals. Maybe, Starlight answered. It looks the same, but I don't think it's loneliness. Seastar watched the group for a moment. Knowledge share. Fill in the gaps in what we know? Actually, we've got a question first. Valet grinned and leaned forward. Then, her look turned serious. This Efer stuff is basically like the world's blood or something? You definitely call it the live stream. Give me all the reasons you've considered for why ponies maybe shouldn't do this. Niala looked grateful. Seastar looked slightly caught off guard. We have an administrative ethics department. Sure you do, Valet folded her hooves. I just want to know the kinds of things they thought about. You're a teacher, you like pop quizzes. She pointed a wing back at the crystals. And just to be clear, I'm asking because something bad happened, and it looks like you weren't 100% ready. Anemone stepped forward. If you really want to know, that's part of why we're doing it. We don't know a lot about what can happen to the live stream when you interact physically with it, but we have a lot of equipment to measure that, and the university decided it was far better for us to experiment on it, being fully able to stop if we detected something bad happening, than to let knowledge on it be pioneered by someone who might have other goals or just not care. If you want a true worst-case scenario, it's possible that were it to disappear entirely, Either the world would literally crumble, or all life would lose the ability to reproduce, and the world would be extinct within a generation. There are millions of scenarios we could consider that are less dire than those two as well. The point is that this has never been studied before within a section of the world, and it's best if ground is broken by someone responsible enough to care. Valet sat back and blinked, then glanced at Niala. If you guys have that kind of integrity, yeah, I'd say that's a pretty decent answer. Niala didn't look quite appeased. What she said is correct, Seastar cut in. I'd appreciate shifting our focus back to the topic at Hufto. You were saying this thing may still be a type of harmony? Starlight glanced at the crystal and made a face. There's nothing harmonic about that thing. Seastar stared at her. But you said it was a motion given physical form. Well, they tilted her head. Yeah? What does that have to do with harmony? This, Seastar sighed, is why I was afraid we might have the same names for different things. Seat yourselves and listen. 
Everyone listened, and the professor began. Harmony, simply put, is a thing, for lack of a better word, that has a dual nature as substance and concept. Does that make a lick of sense to any of you? Valet and Niala both looked confused, but Stolik nodded. Like how ether is hope, but you can touch it. Exactly, Seastar praised. There are a lot of categories it can be broken up into, but in essence, it is a bridge material between the physical world and our minds, thoughts, and emotions. Some have theorized that this implies the world may exist in two distinct planes, one physical one and another mental or emotional one, with harmony acting as a link between them, but there is no way to test this hypothesis. Regardless, harmony acts as a mechanism by which thinking creatures can conform the world around them to their wells. Ah, Valet frowned and pushed the stool. I just willed that still to move and then conformed it to my will. Harmony? Yes, the professor replied. Because you are a harmonic life form. In metaphysical terms, your body is such a vessel by which you can act upon the world. This is why life and harmony are so closely related. Valet blinked. As for exactly how it's categorized and what subtypes exist, I'm afraid I can't tell you, Seastar continued, because if you're serious about this, there's a good chance some of our theories need updating and are wrong. Starlight sat stoically for the speech. None of this sounded too different from what she had heard from the Flame of Love at Garshiva's Crystal Palace. Maybe she hadn't shared as much with her friends as she thought she had. Probably because of Chrysalis. Well, good to know we're talking about completely different things, Valet sighed. So your harmony is different from the stuff we find in the Crystal Palaces. Honestly, the reason we have these Windigo hearts in the first place is because they act as batteries for that. So I'm a little surprised they don't just suck the ether up. Anemone adjusted her glasses. Say more about these Crystal Palaces? Neville shrugged. They're palaces, and this might blow your minds, but they're made of crystal. Look, if you want to have an extended talk about this, that's great, but I think my friends are bored. You have other plans? Seastar asked, glancing at a clock. Neville patted her flank. Someone was curious about the workings of a certain butt brand, and I kind of wanted to get the scoop on a certain gravity machine. Curiosity for curiosity, you know? Anemone stared longingly at Valet's cutie mark. Alas, a certain someone else is too busy cleaning up a lab to participate. If any of your brains have ideas on how to get rid of these, it's in all of our best interests to help me. Ah, bananas, Valet got to her hooves. Someone get me a hammer. If hitting it hard didn't work, let's try hitting it harder. End of chapter 911